Hello, everyone. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. I am Melanie McCorder. I'm the development coordinator here at Historic Santa Fe Foundation. I'm normally joining you in the offices at the foundation, but joining from home today. So welcome to my home. Um, I am uh, pleased to, that you joined us for this joint presentation between Historic Santa Fe Foundation and the New Mexico History Museum. I am the development coordinator for Historic Santa Fe Foundation. Our website is historicsantafe.org. You can find out lots of information about us there. Or if you're in Santa Fe, you can come by and visit us on Historic Canyon Road. We're located at 545 Canyon Road. Um, we do these monthly talks um, uh, usually for members. This one's a free one, so we're pleased to have a, a very wide audience. We have a couple of other upcoming talks uh, in April. There are two planned so far with Victor Yamada on the Japanese internment camps in New Mexico, a history that some of you may or may not be familiar with. And Richard Miller is going to talk about his new book with the University of New Mexico Press on April 29th on with um, his book is on John Slough, the uh, Union general who um, helped to defend New Mexico from the Confederates um, back in the Civil War, in the American Civil War. So we would love if you could attend some of those. Uh, the information about those is under the events on historicsantafe.org. We're a member-based organization and the salon talks are free for members and you're welcome to join us on our email list if you just wanna find out about other events because we do host um, in-person events when we can do that again. And we do host free events on occasion like this one. We're happy to offer this with um, Tom Tom Leach and Carmichael Malley today. So you're joining us today with the video and the audio off. So you're welcome to post questions in the chat during the talk or afterwards. Um, I would kind of moderate some of your comments in the chat because everyone can see it. But um, if you post some comments there, uh, comment, comments or questions, I'll read the questions near the end of the talk. Um, we'll kind of wrap it up about uh, quarter till, 10 till, something like that. So that we'll have um, some time for questions. So today we have Cormac O'Malley, who many of you may know, and Tom Leach, who many of you may know. And if you don't know them, then you'll know them pretty well by the end of this talk. They're both um, fantastic speakers and great guys. Um, Cormac O'Malley is the son of Ernie O'Malley, who he'll be speaking quite a bit about today, the Irish author, and Helen Hooker from Connecticut. Cormac was born in Ireland, but came to the U.S. at age 14 to live with his mother after his father died in 1957. For over the last uh, 30 years, Cormac has helped to preserve his father's literary and historical image by republishing the earlier works, including well-known books and newly discovered manuscripts. The publications include books, exhibitions, and a documentary. In 2020, he produced a documentary film on his parents' artistic journey in Ireland, A Call to Art, to arts, and most recently his collaboration with Tom Leach that you'll see here at the Palace of the Governor's Press and New Mexico History Museum to produce the artist book that we will be discussing today, I Call My Soul My Own. Cormac is joining us from his home in Connecticut today. Our other panelist is Tom Leach of the Palace of the Governor's Press and New Mexico History Museum, where he's currently director of the press. He has for more than 40 years, he has for more than 40 years experience in printing, paper making, and related book arts. He's also been the curator at the New Mexico History Museum since 20, um, since 2001, producing the St. John's Bible, Jack Kerouac and the Writer's Life, Gustav Bauman and Friends, artist cards from the holidays past and other exhibitions. Tom is the recipient of Santa Fe Mayor's Award for Excellence in the Arts, the 2014 Carl Herzog Award for Excellence in Book Design, and the 2017 Edgar Lee Hewitt, Hewitt Award from the New Mexico Association of Museums. He holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in Painting and Sculpture from Sekius, oh, excuse me, Tom, a college in Grand Rapids, you'll have to correct me on that one, Michigan. He has exhibited at um, uh, Historic Santa Fe Foundation Sala in the past with a couple of exhibitions, including Poetry Broadsides and a collaborative exhibition with Colorado-based artist Patricia Music um, based on the words of Shakespeare. So we're delighted today to have both of them here. And I am would like to really start maybe uh, the discussion 
with Cormac and maybe asking him to talk about the words, uh, I call my soul my own and where they came from. And maybe to read the um, diary entry from your father where the, the, the namesake book is named after. So thank you both guys for both for joining us and I'll let you kind of take over the discussion. Um, thank you, uh, Melanie. And I hope uh, I'm uh, audible. Anyway, I'm going to start with actually reading uh, what uh, Tom has published. Um, and it's an entry uh, diary. Uh, and uh, then I'll do some explanation in the background. And this is a dialogue between two characters. And you can see who is explaining in very short terms. What the hell are you doing near Indian country? Why aren't you working? You have done, you have not done any work practically for the last two weeks. You have not chopped wood, cooked meals, washed up. You've not written save to placate your ego in what you call a diary. What good are you to yourself or anyone else out here? None. Well then, examine your conscience. You did not report back to your office. Therefore, you forfeit respect that you lo and lose whatever introductions they might have given you to businessmen. Yes. You risk arrest. Yes. You are liable to be refused entry to this country again. Yes. You did not depart in September when you might have had a chance at getting work at home in Ireland before Christmas. Yes. You have not brought along your uh, physiology book so that you could study it in your spare time to resume medicine when you get sick. When you get sick, note the emphasis, Ernest B. No. You have spent what money you have. You will arrive in New York practically without money. Then you will have to pay for grub, rooms, and look for work. True, O oh, King. I thought you were going to do a library course in Paris when you had money. Yes. Your yes is becoming monotonous, my friend. It is not humility. It is a habit uh, of disarmament. Then why are you here? It brings ease and peace, the heights of the desert. And what does it matter if one has little money, if one can be independent? To be content is the main thing, not to be warped at the mule kicks of life, to play a straight game as one can, not to speak badly of anybody, to preserve balance, an open mind, to give an ear and a hand to the oppressed. Don't be theoretical, practice what you believe. Well, that sounds all right, but could you not have remained at home in your own country? I've often heard you say that emigration was a curse. One should endeavor to remain. Yes, but I could not get work. My name was enough to damn me. No offers of work? Yes, I had become a member. I uh, might have become a member of parliament, but I would have had to take an oath of allegiance. I might have applied for secretarial uh, work uh, to Fianna Foil, but their party was willing to take the oath. I might have applied for service and pension, wounds pension, but I did not believe in gratitude for services given freely. I might have joined the Free State Army, but I would have had to work against my comrades. I think you're a fool. Foolishness is relative. I mean, I th might think that you are. Anyway, I call my soul my own. So those are the comments anyway, written in, 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 in a diary, uh, which I found when I was transcribing um, the diary many years ago. Um, and I just want to give you some little background to that. Um, father had come to the country here and was trying to basically write a memoir, his own memoir of his, of his involvement in Irish military affairs. And, but he'd never written before. So one of the things that one does 
is uh, try to figure out uh, how can you start writing? And he started a diary. And, and my theory anyway, it was he was writing two to 3,000 words a day, uh, sometimes reflective, sometimes descriptive. And he was putting into that everything that uh, he knew what to do, really his own experiences. And what he came up with in this particular dialogue, and I think that's maybe why that uh, Tom and I, uh, Tom in, in particular, sort of picked on this and, as a moment, an, an instant in history, where you see a real depth and an insight into somebody's thinking. He's asking himself in his own diary, uh, what is he all about? Um, sometimes we do that in person at night. Um, he'd already expressed uh, a couple of years earlier in Seattle that uh, my soul lies in the arts, in this lies happiness. So we knew that he was thinking about the arts. And here again, he's reflecting in his diaries on the arts of the Indian country, American uh, Indian country that he had seen on his, some of his artistic friends in Taos whom he had met. But he was really also looking at the inner self and what was important to him. And I think Again, what was uh, 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 he was surviving on a shoestring in New Mexico, and that was showing his inner independence, what he wanted to do, what he could do, and um, uh, the background which he reports there, which is an interesting thing, is he's talking about the oath of allegiance in Ireland had he become a member of that parliament or worked for them. And he had been an ant, a person who fought against the treaty with Britain in 1921. And the treaty required an oath of allegiance. So that's a little bit of the background there. Anyway, just want to give that by way of explanation to um, you know, what the diary entry was about. Well, Cormac, can you give us a little more background on, on Ernie, your father, the, the soldier, the writer, the poet, uh, and how did he get to New Mexico? Yeah, well, that, that's that's an interesting story. He was born in the west of Ireland. Uh, his family is from County Mayo. They moved to Dublin. Um, um, the, he was uh, partially involved in the 1916, which is the 1916 Rising. He later uh, joined the Irish uh, Volunteers and became active in the um, Irish Republican Army. He was a, a roving um, uh, organizer for the IRA in the uh, 1919 to 1921. Uh, when uh, the powers that be within the uh, IRA and the Sinn Féin politics agreed to um, settle or have a truce with Britain, uh, he was against that. And when they signed up with, with a treaty uh, in December 1921, uh, when he read the terms of that, uh, which included uh, the oath of allegiance, he was against that. He went on then to be a leader in the Civil War. He was severely wounded both under uh, the British, where he was captured, tortured, and escaped from a major jail, Kilmainham in Ireland. But he was also captured and uh, wounded by the Irish. Anyway, after all of that, um, he was in jail through 1924. He got out. He wasn't shot. He was uh, in a very bad uh, shape. And basically, he traveled for the next 10 years trying to recover his health. And in 1928, he went to America for the purpose of raising funds for an Irish newspaper for Eamon de Valera, uh, the former president of Ireland. And um, he uh, that brought him around uh, to the West Coast. And finally, he decided uh, that that campaign was over. And he had been um, uh, made his declaration that he wanted to get into the arts. And he started writing his uh, memoir. And um, he met uh, up in, in uh, California through friends, uh, uh, Edward Weston, who took a photograph of him, um, which is on the screen now. And he's uh, lived with uh, uh, other friends uh, in um, Pasadena. One of those friends uh, was uh, the Golden family. And the Goldens wanted to uh, go to uh, uh, New Mexico. Um, and see the Grand Canyon. And so he offered to drive them to the Grand Canyon. Uh, and there's a photograph of uh, the car that he actually uh, uh, drove the family in. Um, now, they were on the way uh, and they were talking about uh, what to do. And one of the persons that uh, my father wanted to meet was Ella Young. 
Ella Young was an Irish mystic who was living in California, but that summer she happened to be in Taos, New Mexico. And so uh, they drove on uh, across uh, uh, the, uh, the landscape into Santa Fe and up to, to, to Taos, where uh, she, uh, they met um, Mabel Dodge Luhan, who is uh, quite a character uh, and had created her own sort of little um, artistic colony there and her uh, husband, uh, Tony uh, Luhan. Um, Fallen met them, stayed with them off and on, uh, uh, went around the country. Um, but that was in the course when he was writing his diaries that we, uh, we had cited. So a little bit uh, later, he went uh, the next year, 1930, he went down to um, uh, Santa Fe and uh, he was uh, giving lectures in Santa Fe on Irish literary topics. And it was in the course of that that uh, he met um, uh, um, uh, Dorothy Stewart um, in, in El Zaquan. In fact, he gave a lecture in the main principal hall of uh, the Santa Fe uh, 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 foundation offices. Um, in that fall, he met uh, uh, Theodora uh, Goddard and um, Theodora and Dorothy and Ernie headed off to Mexico in December uh, 1930. Um, uh, Dorothy did a, a sketch of, of Ernie uh, when the, on their first day in Mexico and they sent it back uh, uh, to, um, to friends in uh, Santa Fe. Then um, that was about uh, six, nine months they stayed in Mexico. Uh, Ernie helped drive them around. Um, I'm sure that Dorothy was doing some of the, her early study work for uh, a book uh, which uh, Tom will refer to. Um, and uh, when he came back in August of 19. Uh, uh, 31. Basically, he uh, uh, left uh, Santa Fe. Uh, they had agreed that they were going to do a book together. And in fact, that never came about. So due to collaboration between Tom and myself, we're, we're bringing um, some of the impact which my father had wanted to do to share uh, the valuable work and artistic heritage uh, that uh, Dorothy had uh, brought to life in her own artwork. Anyway, um, father went back to uh, Taos that uh, uh, winter and befriended uh, Paul Strand, who was a photographer who was then living in, in uh, uh, Taos. And uh, they met and struck a long time uh, friendship. He took a photograph of my father too. So um, after that, uh, father returns east in 1932, marry, uh, meets a, a, a charming uh, uh, artist, my mother, Helen Hooker, who was a sculptor photographer. Uh, and um, they uh, go back to Ireland and, and uh, marry. Um, they don't live happily ever after, as the story goes, but that's another story. Anyway, he had, um, that's how he got to New Mexico. So, um, Tom, let, you tell us something uh, uh, for those people who don't know anything about uh, Dorothy Stewart, where she came from and uh, what she was like as an artist. Well, sure. Uh, Dorothy was born in Philadelphia, uh, 1891. So she was uh, six years Ernie's senior. Um, at, uh, in 1910, uh, so she would have been 19 years old, she and her mother, went to Europe for the first time. Um, Dorothy came back and studied at the Philadelphia Academy of Art uh, for four years. Um, and then in 1921 on a Western road trip with her sister Margareta, uh, coming down from Mesa Verde and through Gallup, they arrived in Santa Fe. Um, obviously they were quite taken with it and uh, uh, after a few more years, they ended up here permanently. Uh, Margareta bought a number of houses. Um, and uh, um, one of them being El Zaguan, where uh, Dorothy lived. And which, which is, was said before, 
the headquarters of the Historic Santa Fe Foundation. Now, this photograph of Dorothy, which we've included in our book, um, I just love this. And I have to say, I've never seen a picture of Dorothy where she's not wearing a wide brimmed hat. Um, uh, but, and this, the photograph comes from our photo archives at the Palace of the Governors. Um, and uh, so let's go on to the next slide. Um, and we've included this photograph of Ernie on our title page. Um, this photograph was taken by Cormac's mother, Helen Hooker. Um, and I think it's just a really wonderful revealing portrait. Um, I wanna say a few words about this title page. The, uh, the lettering that's done on this was by um, our good friend, uh, Pat Music up in Colorado Springs, who knows more about Irish lettering than almost anybody. She's done a, a lot of studies and practice of it over the years. Um, and as I was sort of wrestling with the design of the book, it just occurred to me, I had to ask Pat to do this. So um, we came up with that. Um, let's see. So I think you also asked me, Ernie, um, or Cormac, uh, what interested... Uh, yeah, what, what interested you as a publisher in, right, in, in Ernie's works and in and, and combining these with uh, Dorothy's uh, art? Yeah, well, for, for the first part of that is um, my introduction to Dorothy was through some of her um, later work, if we can move on to the next slide. Um, uh, and uh, this is a title page from her 1953 Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, where uh, she, I just thought that she was doing some amazing um, reinterpretation of William Shakespeare. Um, in I think about uh, 30 some pages, uh, she, she designed, uh, well, she abridged the play for one thing. She basically attacked the play. Uh, you can see here on the title page how she has uh, spelled Shakespeare. Um, and then she uh, created uh, probably hundreds of block prints in multiple colors. Um, I get a kick out of all the rules that she broke uh, in uh, as a printer. Um, she really flaunted the rules of printing. Um, Gustav Bauman referred to her ability to revel in the most difficult combination of type and illustration. If you'll go on to the next slide, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Um, this is uh, not exactly fine printing, but the more I thought about it, she really was um, breaking some rules with uh, printing and uh, breaking new ground. Uh, I had never seen anything quite like this before. So uh, needless to say, um, I was really attracted to her as a printer. Uh, and I then as we went along, I got to know her more as a character. Um, if you'll go, because, you know, this was my first impression of Dorothy, um, but she had an earlier career, I would say, let's go on to the next slide. Um, when in the 1930s, when she was in Mexico with Ernie, she researched and wrote and had printed this book, uh, Ornacinas Niches and Corners of Mexico City. Uh, and she really captures, uh, next slide or two, um, she really captures, I think, the, the vernacular architecture and um, also these wonderful anecdotes about the neighborhoods of Mexico City. And um, it proved that she was really quite a fine writer. Now, when I first saw the prints that um, Ernie took back to Ireland uh, that are in Cormac's collection, um, you know, my first thought was that they were rather primitive. And this was early on in her career as a printer. So um, quite honestly, they are a little crudely printed. But then again, the more I looked at them, they have a, a wonderful rhythm and energy to them. 
um, let's let's click on to the next one. I, I love uh, that one because of the way um, that he's in a very modern way. Uh, she didn't get the whole character. She had half sort of hanging out. And that's a fantastic uh, uh, bleeding effect, uh, which, oh, photo yeah. which photographers yeah. use. Yeah, yeah. And then this one too. And I think, you know, it, it captures something that Dorothy saw in New Mexico. Uh, this is titled Thrashing. Um, but I can't help but think that Ernie really responded to this in terms of what he might have seen in Ireland. So um, this is included in the, uh, in the book. Let's just move on to the next slide there. Um, so this is a picture of the way the prints um, look in the book. And what we've done, I've tipped them in and tipping in is a matter a way of uh, gluing the uh, prints in uh, not printing the, the print directly on the paper. So you actually get a printed object with this. And we have eight of these. Um, and I used a paper that was very similar to the paper that uh, Dorothy would have used. In fact, when I think about Dorothy's printing, what really uh, strikes me almost more than anything is her, her use of paper and unusual papers, uh, things that most printers weren't working on at all. Um, so um, I tried to get that feeling into the, uh, into the book. So these, the prints are printed uh, uh, on almost tissue-like uh, Chinese bamboo paper. Um, let's see. And then I believe Cormac, you wanted me to say um, why, what attracted me to this book? Why did I want to publish it? Yeah, how did you put this, the, the, the two people together? Because uh, we, we met one afternoon and uh, an hour later we had a book. <laughs> yeah, that was about it. Well, first I want to uh, thank my colleague, Hannah Abelbeck from um, the photo archives because she brought you into the press and introduced us. And uh, as we spoke and you showed me the um, uh, another version of this book and or of the text. And when I read it, I immediately identified with uh, the character of Ernie talking to himself. Um, so it was, you know, just this instantaneous decision this decision to say, you know, I have to print this. Um, and it was uh, sort of, it occurred to me uh, typographically, I could see it laid out the way we actually spread it out in the book. Um, I think let's go, maybe the next slide shows one page. No, it doesn't, um, but we can get back to that. Yeah, there, that's, that's how we have laid this out in the book where the, the questioner is on one side and the answer is on the other. Um, and I just wanted to put a lot of space around it uh, to slow the reader down, um, uh, to actually allow them to ask their own question or give their own answer. Um, this isn't something you wanna just blast through. And for that matter, um, I enjoy reading it over and over again, and I hope you do too. Um, uh, I just love the way the words unfolded, but it truly was. Um, as soon as I read it, I knew we had a book. Um, and we looked at some of the, uh, at the, uh, I had a, brought with me a portfolio. In fact, my father's entire portfolio of um, prints that Dorothy had run off in, in basically 29 and 30. And they've been sitting over in Ireland for, I don't know, 30, 40 years. And, Based in essence, 90 years later, because this is uh, 2021, and they traveled in the year uh, 1931. So it's 90 years later that this sort of dream that both of them had 
um, of uh, collaborative work, uh, he writing and explaining um, uh, because she had read some of his writing at, uh, as of that time and she had heard him uh, lecture um, in Santa Fe. So um, he was eloquent enough, I presume, that she thought uh, he would do a good job. Um, and um, he never got to do that. Um, uh, she uh, tried to be in touch with him later on when she um, traveled in, in Europe. Uh, but um, in those days, uh, without the email connection where you, you can be uh, fortunately and unfortunately tracked down wherever you get an email, in those days, uh, she didn't have the, the right address for him. And he was moving around between different houses and the family uh, and the summer. And so uh, though I have those notes, um, it, it just sad that they never met up again because uh, they could have perhaps gotten back on track. Yeah. But uh, there is there's some more of of uh, of her works in in Santa Fe and uh, sorry in in Albuquerque uh, down at the uh, the little theater, uh, the big major fresco that she has uh, at the uh, Los uh, Los Moros y Cristianos. Um, in the little theater in Albuquerque, is I haven't that, actually seen that, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if that is the mural is still there. I've seen pictures of her working on it, but I, I'd love to know and find out, um, and see the mural if it's there. If anyone knows, let us know, please. And there's that we've discovered that uh, some of her work is there are major collections in private hands uh, of her work and um, some friends who, who are listening in uh, um, uh, due to the golden influence. I mentioned that my uh, father had uh, met the uh, golden family, Helen Golden uh, in Pasadena and with her. Uh, he drove her to New Mexico and helped move the family. And they eventually got uh, stayed in, in Ranchos de Taos. And uh, when Mrs. Golden uh, got sick in uh, 1932, uh, my father uh, uh, went up to uh, and stayed with the Golden family when she was off in the hospital with pneumonia. And so, um, uh, some of my father's papers, in fact, uh, one or two of the books that I've published were papers that uh, were discovered in that in the in that house in the Golden household. And I'm uh, very good uh, friends with uh, um, Peter Katz, who's a grandson of Helen, and has inherited uh, some of her materials. So we're having uh, great fun um, uh, talking about uh, uh, Margreta. Um, and um, he recently sent me a Nebraska Recollections, uh, published in Santa Fe in 1957 and also a very beautiful original um, a book about um, uh, um, DNS, which is published after her death in 1957 and has some of these materials. So um, anyway, uh, she, she is, uh, hopefully uh, we will get a place that will have an exhibit of, of her work and put her back on the stage. And I think uh, what you've done so credibly uh, is put a, a beautiful uh, representation. Let, let me also just say, and thank you. Um, uh, well, here, here, here's the book. Why don't you talk about the book? Okay, sure. Well, one other thing, uh, another part of that question of why take on something like this to begin with uh, is you know, a task of the curator, a curator at the History Museum um, is to uh, show how New Mexico is connected to the rest of the world. Um, and um, that we are influenced by outside people and events. And in turn, how New Mexico reaches other people um, around the world. So this struck me as an opportunity to inform New Mexicans about Ernie O'Malley, um, a very interesting person. Um, and also to let others, uh, perhaps in Ireland, to know more about us. So that's that's a, that's another reason. You know, that's what we do. What, that's why we do what we do. So in in terms of making the book, um, let's go back to that page of marbled paper because I think I can. There we go. So um, as I was working on the book, it occurred to me that this was very much 
uh, in the spirit of an album on the quorum or a friendship book. And this is a, in the, in the tradition of books, um, uh, these were carried by pilgrims often going to the Middle East, um, to the Holy Land and coming back uh, and with pieces of paper that they had collected along the way and marbled paper was something that was um, happening in, in um, the Muslim world and in the Holy Land, um, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't known in Europe. And so that's how marbling got into, into um, Europe and into the, you know, the Western book art tradition. Well, um, as I was looking for the various elements to put the book together, uh, I found in my studio a piece of marble paper that I had done. And it was, um, I just said, yeah, we have to use the marbling for this. For this. Uh, and so as I went along, like I said, I realized that this book is a friendship book and in some small way, it is that book that uh, they had hoped to publish together. Um, the color well, scheme, go that, ahead. That cover is so beautiful. I mean, the, the, speak about the color and, and how you came up with those colors, because I, I have my own interpretation, but but uh, let, let's hear yours. Well, I, I just wanted to put some New Mexico into it. So we have turquoise and we have the red earth. Um, what I desperately wanted to avoid in the design of this book um, uh, would be to fall into using um, the stereotypical emerald green for Ireland, uh, you know, and I didn't want to put in any shamrocks or uh, leprechauns, you know, just really wanted to get away from that. But I just wanted to get um, the feel of the earth and the sky um, and the water um, that is so precious to New Mexico and so abundant to Ireland, I guess. Uh, and uh, this is also the very first uh, pattern of marbling. When marbling began, this is called a stone or agate pattern. And this is where the term marbling comes from. So um, this here is a sheet just fresh out of the vat. Uh, and, you know, it just seemed to work very, very well with uh, the rest of the book. Um, I did mention that uh, going through in the planning of this book, uh, I tried lots of different things. Um, it went through many different iterations. In fact, Cormac, when I think I first showed you the first, first prototype, it was about five inches by five inches. It was rather small, mm -hmm. um, but it just grew in importance to me and it really asked for a larger typeface. I, I started with a, a different typeface. We even set the type uh, two or three times uh, before I settled on what I did, and which uh, in some ways uh, brings to mind the what's called the the uh, uh, Easter Proclamation or the Proclamation of the Republic printed in Ireland in in uh, 1916, and uh, it was printed covert covertly, and the printers didn't have enough type to do the whole thing at once, so. Um, you know, they had to set print half of it, put the type away and then reset it and print the other half, which if you'll go to the page that shows uh, the handset type, um, uh, that's exactly what I had to do. Um, uh, maybe the next one. Yeah. So after the all the type for this book was set by hand. Um, and then uh, in order to set the next page, in some cases, I had to take the type apart and pick letters from one, you know, one word and put it into another until we got to the end. Um, so uh, this was really a book. Uh, and again, this was in the spirit of Dorothy Stewart, where uh, she, I know she was making it up as she went along. And that's not my norm, normal way of doing it. But this was an opportunity to to follow in her footsteps. <laughs> well, the, the, you know those the colors uh, remind me of of uh, and and when you think of his response to one of the questions, uh, it brings ease and peace, the heights of the desert, and so what I think you have captured uh, on on the uh, cover of the book is 
the heights of the desert and the blue of the sky, um, which is bringing this uh, lonely Irishman to um, uh, uh, raise and question what he is about. And he gives a very substantial answer. But I mean, I think, you know, and, and uh, the feel of, of this with its, uh, 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 with the um, prints included, it's just a marvelous uh, uh, representation of what um, uh, Dorothy Stewart as an artist uh, was about. And um, I think uh, um, all of the, uh, uh, of her heirs of whom there are, uh, well, she has no heirs directly. Uh, she was one of uh, five sisters, um, but uh, there are descendants who should be very proud of the work that uh, uh, Dorothy did and, and that uh, Tom has been able to reproduce. And I hope that uh, there will be uh, others uh, and more of them in the future. Uh, well, thank you. Um, the slide that's up right now, I want to mention because uh, uh, that is another sketch that that Dorothy did of Ernie, and I printed one out and had it sitting there on the, the press. And there were various times where I would, as I said, I was making this up as I went along and I would have to ask Ernie what he thought about it. And um, uh, I, I swear in one or two instances, he gave a little smile and a nod. So um, that, that's how we arrived at what we did. Yeah, the, that was written on, uh, in fact, just to show how small the world is, uh, that was um, on the corner of a letter uh, written by uh, Ernie and Dorothy, mostly in Dorothy's hand, uh, their first morning in Mexico City on January 6th, 1931. And um, she did some other arrangements uh, around that, but uh, she she captured uh, uh, his image. And there's a, a second one, which is included in the book also um, uh, showing him uh, at that time. So, um, I, you know, she was a very adroit uh, artist uh, and the technicalities which uh, she has written uh, into that uh, uh, Hornacinas uh, book uh, are the technical aspects of what uh, uh, was incorporated into the, the, the niches, the corners, uh, the, the top of buildings um, that uh, Tom referred to. And she was able to go in with her artistic background um, as well as she took a little time at the University of Pennsylvania um, uh, auditing if she wasn't actually allowed to take it, uh, an all male architectural course. And so she was interested in this, these materials. And when she got out to New Mexico and met uh, Kate Chapman um, uh, in 1926, 27, again, they had a lifelong friendship um, and uh, were able to capture uh, a lot of these materials in, in, uh, as they went forward in, in, in their life. Yeah, uh, Dorothy and Kate Chapman wrote a book uh, called Adobe Notes about building with Adobe. It was printed by Spud Johnson, but, but uh, Dorothy did the linoleum cuts. And that's another minor New Mexico classic. So Tom and Cormac, we are um, getting close to about the 15 minutes before the hour. We got about just a couple more minutes left before we'll kind of open it for questions. If you guys are about ready to wrap up, I can show some more of the slides and let you just kind of finish up if y'all want to open it to questions in a minute. Do you well, want me to just go through some more of the slides, Tom? Um, sure, go through. I'm not sure what slides come up next. Yeah, we'll just see. It's just a mix of the book okay. and all the artist, okay. artistry of the book. Oh, no, that's the end. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Well, well, then, you know, I do want to ask Cormac, um, after Ernie went back to Ireland, what became of him? Well, that's that's another another whole story. Uh, he wrote the, some books, right? He, he so wrote yeah, books. well, in fact, he had been writing his memoir in New Mexico, and by the time he got to New York, um, he sent it to a lot of publishers and um, failed to get it published. But when he back 
went back to Ireland, found a far more sympathetic uh, group of people who understood what he was talking about. And that book became uh, his uh, signature book uh, called On Another Man's Wound. And it was a story of the War of Independence, uh, which went from uh, basically uh, his activities from 1918 to 1921. And the book was written as uh, an entire um, uh, memoir through the period when he got out of uh, a prison in 1924. But uh, his advisors uh, recommend his not publishing the second half of the memoir. And I published that. It was called The Singing Flame, and it goes from uh, the truce in 1921 through uh, July 1924. Um, and so, I mean, other books uh, uh, I found in his drawers. Um, and they have been published, uh, his diaries have been published. Um, and um, it's been, I've been trying for some years to put him back on a shelf. Um, and uh, we hope that Dorothy will get, get back on her shelf uh, as uh, they both deserve. Okay, Thanks, other, you guys. Well, one other thing I'd, I'd just have to ask you, Cormac, um, about the movie, The Quiet Man. Uh, because I was startled when you and I had this conversation uh, and I mentioned that I had watched The, the Quiet Man. In fact, my wife and I watch it every St. Patrick's Day. Um, it's become a tradition, but a uh, movie with uh, John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara. And it turns out that Ernie and you were involved in the making of that. Yeah, my father had one of the people he met uh, down in, in California at that time that he was uh, living there, uh, Bartram, uh, Edward West and, and the Goldens, he'd met John Ford. And when uh, Ford, uh, who'd always wanted to make a, an Irish film, had made The Informer in, um, uh, about that period, I think it was 1929. So he wanted to get, uh, to get another full-time, full-length movie. Uh, going and he would uh, found a story um, and was hoping that could be made into a, a movie. And the quiet man, he, he got into it in 1950, uh, uh, came over to Ireland and did the filming in 1951 and asked uh, my father to be one of his uh, technical assistants. Originally, the movie had a, an element of IRA background. But that was filtered out uh, both through uh, California uh, uh, management, because that was not a topic that could be uh, safely discussed in a film at the time, they thought. Mm -hmm. And also um, other things evolved. But there, there was great characters, John Wayne, uh, Maureen O'Hara, Victor McLaughlin. And I would occasionally go over on the scene. We lived about uh, 25 miles away from them. And um, Maureen was very kind to me. We had uh, red hair, almost as, almost as good as Melanie's, and uh, bright, brilliant, and, and she was uh, such a, a fun, loving um, lass. Um, and yeah, so uh, uh, we were there and uh, enjoyed making the quiet move, uh, quiet man. And there have been several books uh, produced by uh, Des McHale with more detail about that background and uh, at one point Maureen O'Hara gave me her collection of photographs um, and um, I've passed them on and uh, Des had been able to use them so it was uh, it was fun time. It just shows another aspect of this uh, interesting fellow. Um, he is spotted in a few scenes too. Um, <laughs> yeah yeah in the crowd scene yeah. Yeah. And he made a second movie in 1956 with John Ford when John Ford came back. But okay. anyway, should we go on to questions, uh, Melanie? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Tom, for throwing that one in there. That was pretty interesting. There's a little interesting tidbit. Um, I, I'm going to start uh, with one here from Laura Holmes of um, how did you print the wood? I imagine this is for you, Tom. How did you print the woodcuts? And are they reproductions or using original woodcuts or lino cuts? And then she says, uh, do her woodcuts still exist? OK, number one, they aren't woodcuts. They were linoleum cuts. Um, at least, you know what? Now that you mention it, um, I know her later work was linoleum, but the actual, the, the, that 1929 series, I don't know if it was a linoleum. I always assumed it was. However, um, 
whatever they were, um, we photographed them and made polymer plates. So they were printed from polymer plates. My colleague at the, in, at the press, James Borland, uh, shot the negatives and made the plates. And that's what we printed uh, the um, reproductions on. So they are reproductions. They're reproduced at, oh, between 50 and 65% um, in order to fit the book. But they are, I would consider them, um, uh, well, they, they, they're, re <laughs> they're really truly printed from ink on um, paper uh, and, and not a photographic reproduction, so to speak. Um, Someone also just followed up from um, the question that you had, Tom, and they asked Cormac, what was the second movie that you mentioned? Maybe the other John Ford movie? Uh, the second movie is, um, I always have trouble remembering this, um, the, uh, it was made in 1956, and there were three short films. Its original uh, name was um, Three Leaves of a Shamrock, uh, but they uh, changed the name to be named after one a play written by um, um, Augustus, uh, 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 Lady Gregory, um, and it's about moon. Um, anyway, it might come to me. I, I okay, don't know. Have... Yeah, okay, later on. But someone had posted in here too that, that you can see photos of um, young Carmack and er Ernie on Quiet Man and the photo album of the Irish US edition. Uh, so I can probably post that somewhere. Everybody can look at it in the comments or if someone's watching otherwise later, they can ask us about this and I'll try and get that link to that's over here. Well, um, the, per the person who made that comment should, should know well because uh, um, um, she in fact uh, helped do a, an exhibit of my mother's photographs of, of Ireland um, in uh, uh, Ireland, the Gallery of Photography along with the National Library in 2019. So she knows more about my collection than I do. Good. Yeah, well, I can probably post that too. So, um, you know, if people could email me too later on through the website if they want me to put some things up and some follow-up links because I'll be posting this video later too. And I can put it below the YouTube or I can put it on our website. Rising um, of the Moon, that's the name of the movie. Rising so, of the Moon. Okay, Rising good. of the Moon, the play good. by Lady Gregory. Yeah. Okay. And then um, there were some questions too, which may have been answered about like the making of the book, um, Tom, but someone did uh, ask a question. Um, I think your assistant, maybe Carmack Chabon, if I'm saying Chabon correctly. Um, how did you get the brilliant colors on the marbled paper? Well, it's the pigments that I use. Um, I use acrylic paints. Um, and it would be a whole nother lecture for me to talk about marbling, believe me. Um, but uh, uh, that's just the choice of the colors uh, that I used. Uh, uh, I did mix a combination of phthalo, phthalo green and phthalo blue, and then um, uh, iron oxide for the red. Yeah, I think you may end up having to do like a, a workshop just on marbled paper. There's another question that popped up on the marble paper. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, about doing a custom batch. Maybe like maybe we can have you do a uh, marbled paper demo. Like, at, okay, uh, next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because she, she wanted to know if it was actual marbled paper. Um, and Well, you know, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's one question. Uh, among the War of Independence combatants, this might be for, maybe for you, Cormac, um, was Ernie uh, uniquely interested in contemporary art and in cultures beyond Ireland, or did other combatants share his interests? Well, you know, when you're in thick of, uh, when you're in the thick of war, you're pretty uh, tied down to local uh, factors, but there were people uh, within, uh, uh, primarily after, the struggle and in jail, father found a lot of people uh, because they had time on their hands and they were able to read. Um, uh, he knew people uh, like Erskine Childers and Robert Barton and um, uh, uh, um, uh, Liam O'Flaherty and um, Pather Donalds. I mean, a lot of these people uh, 
when they had time to think uh, had re and, and reflected on their own artistic um, uh, level. So uh, they weren't unique, but I mean, basically, I think in his memoir, our father would say there weren't too many. He, he had already got an interest in art and wanted to talk to people about art. But as he traveled around the country fighting, there weren't too many people. But um, I mean, one of his good friends were the Plunkets, who is the director of the National Gallery. So there were people uh, who were uh, interested in the arts at the time. Well, we have some comments too. We're not opening up for um, video or audio from the participants because we, we try and kind of keep it to a certain time length. But um, Jan Gilmore, Dr. Jan Gilmore had wrote that she did a bio of Olive Rush, who's actually, whose home is on the Historic Santa Fe Foundation's register. And, um, and it's just up the road on Canyon Road in Santa Fe. And she had, there's a lot of information on Dorothy Stewart contained within that bio too. And then a woman named Susan Martin has, um, uh, she wrote that she's doing a biography of Cormac, of Ernie with Cormac that's about to be published in Dublin this June. And she, she wanted to um, maybe to speak about that a little bit, but you're happy to, um, if you want to send me information about that, Susan, or if Cormac sends me info later, we'll be happy to put that info on, on our website too, about that too. Sure. Well, one of our residents here in, in um, uh, Stonington, Connecticut, Harry Martin, uh, took an interest in, in father and uh, between himself and myself, we've written a, a biography which is about to be published. It'll be called Ernie O'Malley, uh, published uh, in the, by the Marion Press in Ireland uh, this June. So um, we're not quite sure how that will be launched, uh, whether we go through this uh, uh, process as we're doing today or whether we'll have one for the road ourselves in, in real time but probably not yeah well we're happy to post some information about that too as kind of a follow-up to sure. um and um so of course Carmack, you keep in touch with us and susan is welcome to email me too as well sure um, we've got a few more questions that are popping up. I don't know if we'll be able to get to everyone. There's lots of comments too that the book is really beautiful. Um let's see um uh Maybe I'll come back to Patricia's comments. She's talking about she did want, she wanted to reflect Ireland, but without stereotype, the lettering is inspired by several recent Irish manuscripts, including the earliest ones, the Book of Kells and Irish typeface. So, um, and she kind of comments on the butterfly note too in that. Um, yeah. Uh, that, that, that's really a fabulous uh, piece of, uh, of work. And I mean, it, it's um, reflective of, of uh, Celtic and, and yet it's, it's sui generis. I mean, there's a, a certain magic to it. There's almost a sense of humor. And if you look at the way that the S is rolled in um, at, at the, and, and the way that the butterfly is done is so beautiful. And uh, in a page earlier, a uh, little monogram has been done with the initials of uh, EOM and uh, DNS, uh, which again is a complement to, to the imagination um, of, and, and supervision of, of Tom's work. Well, I, I wanted to talk about that uh, since you brought it up. The, uh, uh, at one point in the design of this book, I told Pat to, err on the side of excess and extravagance um, because that's how Dorothy approached books. Um, but as it went along, um, I saw that that wasn't going to work for this particular book. So, um, uh, but one of the sketches Pat did um, in that uh, vein of getting, you know, going over the top. She designed um, a butterfly in in the O, a butterfly being almost a universal symbol of uh, the soul. Uh, and um, so I thought that was brilliant on her part just to insert that. But artistically, that particular butterfly wasn't working. She got her design from a Zuni pot, I believe. Um, and I turned away from our conversation um, on, on the computer to see that I had laying there um, a, a, um, a butterfly that Gustav Bauman had designed that we have recently had turned into um, a, type, a, type, um, a type ornament. And 
I pulled a proof and stuck it in there and it worked just perfectly. So honestly, we have snuck Gustav Bauman into this book. Um, uh, and actually, in another way, the photographs of, of Dorothy and of Ernie, I could not get the original paper that I chose to run through the computer, through my computer printer at home. So I tried a bunch of different things. I ended up using some of Gustav Bauman's paper um, for those two photographs. So um, Gus knew, knew Dorothy, um, respected her. Uh, well, I think everybody respected and uh, enjoyed Dorothy Stewart um, from what I've read, but um, I'm glad we were able to get, um, get his help with the book. Yeah. I know, yeah, you snuck in. I, I was, Pat was kind of saying, ask him about the butterfly, ask him about, and I didn't know if you really wanted to talk about the butterfly. Well, now, really, now my secret is out. Yeah. yeah, I know. I'm really happy you threw that in because I wanted to ask you about the butterfly too. So yeah. good. Okay. I'm glad she was tenacious and asking her questions and then you replied to that one too. So um, I wanted to say that the, the book is available for those of you who want to order it from Carmack, you can contact him directly or at historicsantafe.org. It's currently on our homepage and also in our gift shop and on the page just so that you signed up for the salon. Um, so if you want to order it there, you can order it uh, there um, or contact Carmack. And then I want to throw in, I think we've got, I think I've gotten to most of the questions. I want to throw in one more um, uh, this, from Mary Olson. I don't know if this is the Mary Olson that I know. It's a delightful artist, but we'll just assume this woman's a delightful artist too. Um, it says the idea of a friendship book is intriguing as the connection with the emergence of marbled paper to Europe. Can Tom talk more about the early style of the marbling design? Again, we need a marbling workshop on marbling. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, real briefly, yeah, the, as the, the pattern that I chose was the earliest form of marbling and the early marbling from the, um, the and we're talking about the 14 and 1500s. Um, I have been to Istanbul and studied marbling there. <laughs> And I have to tell you that um, marbling is the first form of abstract art. Um, and um, so, but the early, the earliest marbled papers were this sort of spattered stone-like pattern. Um, and those were the ones that um, were brought back to Europe. But as marbling went from country to country, artists tried different things until it got to the very um, ornate um, um, and, patterned work that you see later, especially in uh, Victorian, the end papers of Victorian books. And that's where most people first encounter marbling. Um, but it's always been an aspect of uh, book design, or at least since about 15 or 1600. Um, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> um, I did wanna say pointing right back here behind me, this is pretty much the stack of books that is, exists so far. This, as I said, it's a handmade book where all these uh, the pages are being tipped in. So we're still assembling them. So um, uh, I would say in another week, they'll be plentiful, but um, bear with us until we get them all made. So if you've ordered the book, um, it will be coming. Yeah, and I like that you replied to one of the comments where you said you made 100 sheets of marbled paper for the book already. And this is amazing work of craft. Um, uh, I, I think it's incredible. And I think it's actually underpriced from someone who knows a good bit about books, but um, I think it's incredibly underpriced because there's so much craft that's tied into this and it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and I think it's um, great that both of you guys kind of connected and created this object. Um, and um, we'll have those on the, the, the shop and also Dr. Jen um, Gilmore's book on Olive Rush is in our shop too. I didn't mean to, to kind of just go quickly through her, one of her comments. And, um, and then if we get the bio, we'll put that in the shop if we can easily get that too. But um, I think this was this was a really great presentation and I'm quite enamored with the book as an object. And I wanna thank you guys for um, presenting. I think well, thank you for having us. Yeah. And what an so, opportunity. Yeah. Can, can I just give a shout out to, uh, the, again, to these, uh, 
<clears throat> Historic Santa Fe Foundation, uh, the New Mexico Museum of History, and in particular, the press uh, uh, of the Palace of Governors and its uh, uh, generous and thoughtful and creative uh, curator and director, Tom. Well done, Tom. Thank yeah, you. everything Thank you, you do is beautiful. And then Cormac put his email in the chat. So it was um, cormac.omalley at gmail.com if anyone wants to contact him directly. So um, for the book or for any other reason, I guess Cormac's a pretty chatty guy. So you can actually go. <laughs> <laughs> and I should say there is uh, uh, research has been doing Elizabeth Barr. Uh, is doing uh, further research on on uh, uh, Dorothy and uh, the it might be forthcoming a biography. I don't know whether uh, or how that will make it, but anyway, uh, Elizabeth, thank you for your help, and I want to say thank uh, uh, Elizabeth Sebastini uh, Berry also for her help in getting me in into this, uh, and and uh, we've had a great relationship. So. Thank you to both Elizabeths, who in fact are uh, collateral descendants of Dorothy. Well, thank you guys very much. And thanks everyone for attending. Um, and we hope to see you again at some of our other future talks that are coming up in April. All right. Great. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye.